Hello, everybody, and welcome to Purgatory Ironworks. I am your host, Trenton Ty, and man, have I got a show for you today. Last time, we made ourselves a nice, super fancy nail header, and it brought up a couple of things I hadn't really thought about for most of you beginners. Because we were working in steel that was one inch by half inch thick. And for most of you guys, that's going to be some monster steel. Most of you are going to be used to working in quarter inch square, maybe three eighths, maybe even half inch. But half inch, as you have found out, is a lot of material to move. And when you step up to something that's one inch by half inch, it's a lot of work. However, get this. The vast majority of the tools, the blacksmith, this is the bottom end of it. Your smallest hammers and top tools are going to be made out of one inch square. So the thing is, is that if you're going to make tooling, you're going to have to understand you've got to get into bigger material. Now, here's the thing. You're getting into bigger material and this stuff right here, inch by half inch, you can do it with a hand hammer. But man, you don't want to. This is a lot of work to do for one person by hand. That's why in the old blacksmith shop, you had several apprentices. They weren't just there to sweep the floor. They were there to swing a sledgehammer. Because when you got into steel of this size, which is necessary for your tooling, you had to have a sledge to move it effectively. And here we are back to that favorite saying, you know, it's not a matter of can you slam your wiener in the sliding glass door, it's should you. Anytime that you start getting into half inch material territory, that is sledge work. That's when you get a buddy and have him work on it while you hold it. Now for today, I'm going to do this all by hand, but I trust me, even as a professional smith, this is a lot of work, but you're going to find out that this size steel is the only thing that's got enough beef to make a lot of the tools that we're going to need. So the piece we have today is, again, uh, one inch by half inch material. This is the same stuff I use for a lot of my tongs. Uh, it has been cut 10 inches long, and I have marked three inches in from each end. What we've got to do is we're going to take this middle section and we're going to double it in length. Right now it's at four inches. We're going to stretch this out to eight inches because we're going to make a loop with this item so that it can go in the vise. I know it sounds weird. Follow along and we'll get it done. Now guys, I'm going to do a little bit of a trick here. I see my mark, I'm going to lay it across the anvil and I'm going to tilt this guy up. And that's how I'm going to get my first incision uh, to actually start spreading everything out. That's what delineates it. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this down all the way to about half the thickness, which should be around a quarter of an inch. And there you can see. Now I'm going to take another heat, and I'm going to do the same thing on this other side. I'm going to go ahead and get that out of the way, and then I'll start working in the middle. I go to the other side. Do the same thing right here. Now, coincidentally, this is the same technique that you use when you're setting up a piece of stock to do an axe with. As many axes have been done on YouTube, I still think I'll, uh, I'll end up doing one for everybody. But All right, so now you can see that we have this area marked out, and now we just need to stretch this thing on out. Now, this was cut at 10 inches. I want the overall length to be 14, so now we just got to go to heat and the beating. This is also where, if you don't have enough room to go all the way across the face, um, if you have an anvil block or something, you're able to get in there because here, you're all wonka jaw. You're catching the sides of the anvil. If you have a block, like this, then you can get in here and work it without a problem. So a block like this is super, super handy. Now 
Now once I get it long enough that it can fit over the anvil, I'll move back over the center of my anvil here where I've got a little bit more mass. I'm not bouncing around as much. Now it is a piece like this that will really teach you to make sure and have the right heat in your metal. Because if you don't, you will work yourself slap to death. Keep it hot so it moves and try not to do any extra work because you're going to need all your Wheaties working on metal this thick. One thing I want to point out is that notice I have tongs specially designed to hold inch by half inch. Now on purpose, I made sure and worked a little bit on the anvil so that you could see that. Notice that I was in complete control of the work at all points. That's because I had the right tongs. If I was sitting there fighting that piece, we wouldn't be getting any work done. That's why when you're starting this work, pick some stock sizes. Yes, this means you may need to end up making tongs for each stock size that you have, but that's the point. You want to have the right wrench for the right nut. And a lot of people don't ever get that comparison. If you're working on a car and there's a 13 millimeter nut, you need a 13 millimeter wrench. You might be able to get by with something else, but it's going to suck. You need to think of tongs in the same fashion. Now, if you've ever wondered where top tools and straight pins and cross pins come in, this is where. So if you're stretching a piece of metal, this is the time that you would actually go over to the anvil and use the top of the anvil to help stretch it. Or if you've got a cross pin. Now this is really where I, I would prefer a straight pin. If you've got your cross pin, this is where this comes in. This helps stretch the metal in two directions and helps the work go faster. Again, this is really something that needs to be sledge work. But there's all different tips and tricks that will help speed the work. And then sometimes you can just beat the poo-poo out of it. Just taking one more heat. Now one other thing I want to point out. Uh, when you're making this, uh, there's a way to make one of these using a drill press and a welder. Uh, I originally thought that I was going to do that one first. However, I was like, you know... Most people are not going to have access to those power tools, so at least let me show everybody how to do this completely by hand. Remember, doing it by hand is the hard way. And as a beginner, you should be doing everything you can not to make it unnecessarily difficult on yourself, simply because, don't worry, there's going to be plenty of tough stuff to come up. Save yourself some issues on this one. Now on this longer run of steel, notice that when I'm hammering, I am overlapping my hammer blows. I am striking a series, almost like I'm using a paintbrush. And that is something that you need to be in the habit of doing. If you're just kind of going at it all willy-nilly, you're not going to get a lot done. There's got to be a little bit of order to how you're striking. It may look like chaos to everybody else, but we as blacksmiths, yeah, man, we got a plan. Now, we're pretty good and thin on this side right here. Uh, still could use some hammering, so I'm going to flip this around, and we're going to work on this end. Remember, as you're working, make a habit. Use that top of the anvil, and keep everything straight in line as you possibly can. It will save you headache. Again, for all the hammering, I'm making sure that uh, everything is nice and in line.
Man. Apparently, I didn't have enough Wheaties this morning. Whoo! That's a lot of hammer ramming. All right, I'm going to get my tape measure out, and we're going to see if that's enough. Please, God, let it be enough. Now that we've got the correct length, uh, I'm going to do two more things before we get ready to actually bend this around the mandrel. So this piece is going to sit in the vise itself, and you're going to be hammering down on the top. Well, if you just have it straight-sided and start hammering on it, I don't care how tight you make that vise, it's going to slide down. So we're going to take the top piece, and we're going to make ourselves a crook. And that crook on both sides is going to catch the top of the vise and prevent it from being driven down. So it should be pretty simple. Uh, right over the edge of the anvil, we're going to do this. The only trick is, is you need to have a nice square corner on that lip. If you don't, uh, your rivet header is kind of going to suck. Have to be mindful of which way you're making this turn. I'm going to put about a half inch over. And I'm going to start driving this down. Now again, you need that square on that edge. So this is where you're going to have to do a little bit of uh, backing up on the material. And this is just where you have to finagle a little bit. And see, I didn't quite get enough on that turn. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab a little bit more material. Maybe? Maybe? Yeah? Yeah, I'm going to grab a little bit more material there. Let's get us a little bit more to work with. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I like. And again, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get a nice square corner on that guy right there. So once you get this turned, uh, really what you want to do is you want to drive that choker down and then do a little bit of upsetting to try to make sure that you've still got that lip there, uh, but you've got a nice square corner. Yeah, yeah, we're getting there. We are getting there. Now this is going to be another one of those sections that's going to be very advantageous to have ourselves an anvil block because if I'm upsetting this guy, I can actually hook it and upset it a lot easier if I've got a piece on the anvil here. A little bit more difficult to do it when you're just uh, using the edge of the anvil. Ain't got a lot of maneuvering space. Not looking too terrible bad, if I do say so myself. Okay, and you can see we are getting that nice square. We're going to take uh, we're going to take another heat. And we're going to bring this on down, and we're actually going to swap to a little bit of a lighter hammer. When I'm doing upsets like this, I often find it advantageous to use a lighter hammer simply because the heavier hammer tends to move the whole piece. You're trying to use the mass of that thing to kind of catch it. Well, there's not really a good way to describe it. If you use a lighter hammer, the more force of the impact stays on that surface that you want to move and it doesn't transfer uh, all the way back to the rest of the piece. Speed of the hammerhead is a little bit more important than the mass of the hammerhead in this junction.
All right, well looky there. We've got ourselves a square corner. Now it's thickened up a little bit. So I'm gonna clean her up. You are gonna want this thing flat. And I think that's going to be good enough for government work. So now we'll need to do this on the opposite side. And we'll be ready to actually groove this bad boy. And then bend it. And then really uh, cinch it down on our piece. Wunderbar. So this time around, I think I'm going to take about three quarters of an inch. I'm going to make this easy on myself. Now, if you'll notice, when you get that extra beef in there, how much easier it is to get that piece to set down and hammer in, way, way easier. So now, I'm going to have a little bit of thinning I'm going to need to do between uh, this side and the other, but that's okay. Uh, you'll save yourself a lot of time if you get more, more than you need because you can always grind it away or hammer it back to the right thickness. All right, now, notice something. Notice I had to swap tongs. And notice here I am fighting this because I can't grab this effectively with my other tongs. So now I'm having to use a set of tongs that's not designed to do this. And guess what? I'm having to spend time dicking around trying to hold this thing because I don't have the specialty tongs that I need to be able to hold this the right way. You're going to run into that a lot, but remember, you can save yourself so much headache if you'll take the time to make the right pair of tongs. So now you've seen two very distinct ways to be able to do a square corner. If you don't get enough material, you can use your lighter hammers and back that material up. However, it is, of course, a lot easier if you'll get enough material to start with, and then you can keep the big hammer and just mush the crap out of it. Several different ways to approach it, some more efficient than others. You're going to run across this a lot uh, as you're doing your work, because, again, as a beginner, you're going to be kind of wildly flailing trying to figure stuff out, and that's okay. There are a lot of different ways to get something done, and it's okay to explore them. Just remember that the, there are objectively better ways to do things, and part of experience is figuring out what gets by and what does it well. Okay, I am good with that. That is going to be enough to or get us close. And I believe I'll either grind or file this on into the shape that I want. Once I get everything squared up. So again, we're not too far off from those two sides. It's not, it's not terrible. 
So more than tolerable. So now I'll take another heat, uh, heat it right here on this edge. I'm going to knock that down about 30 degrees and then we'll go to our mandrel. Now I'm going to end up doing this two ways as well. We're going to do this over the edge of the anvil. We get right there on that turn. I'm going to kick it down. Now notice that when I'm working over the edge of the anvil, this tends to kick up, so I have to keep it flat. Again, it's a mild annoyance, but it will work. What I'm going to do on the next one, though, is I'm going to put it in the vise. And when you have the option, if you're not pressed for time, putting it in the vise is almost always better for bends because you have so much more control over what happens. Now, one thing I want to point out, and the reason that I have a lot of hollow bit tongs or bolt tongs, so these were the ones I was originally using. Uh, again, directly designed to grab onto the end of that inch and a half by half. And again, holds it very well. However, when you have some sort of obstruction, like a bolt head or even something you're working on, the, these tongs, uh, you know, bolt tongs or hollow bits, uh, these are able to give you the courtesy of a reach around. So no matter what you have in here, these bolts can reach around and grab the main shaft there. Uh, it's very handy, uh, it's very comfortable, and uh, a good thing to have in the shop. Very simply, we chuck this up at the bottom of the, of the groove. Notice I'm using a combination of pulling down with the tongs and tapping with the hammer. And that gets us to where we want to be. And that uh, right there needs to be on the floor. That's exactly what I intended. And, uh, you know, don't you doubt it. All right, we've got our piece. Uh, we're going to heat up the middle here. And I'm going to come over to our mandrel and we're going to bend this guy around. Uh, like I said, it's going to be a little bit of a tight bend. I probably could have used a little bit of extra length on there, but we're going to make it work. We got ourselves a good heat here. Now I'm probably going to end up doing this in two heats at the very least. I'm not going to get super excited about it. There's our first bend. I'll take another heat, and I know I'm going to have to bend these up, but I've got a little bit more material than I thought, so I may be able to drop down to here. Get a little bit bigger loop. So there we go. Let's take another heat and see what we can do with it. Here's our second heat. And notice I can flip this guy around using the cross beam and I can actually tuck this piece. And that is kind of sort of what I'm, I'm looking at and want. Oop, here, here we go. Camera, camera. Again, I'm having to fight these tongs to get them in the right position. And there we are getting a lot closer to where I want to be. Now, I can now, after I've got this bad boy wrapped, I can now adjust this top piece until it's a little bit more parallel with the others. That's why when you're doing this to start with, it doesn't super matter if you get the angles right. You will end up correcting them. And uh, let's take a look. If this joker will cooperate. Okay, uh, looking, uh, looking pretty good there. So now I should be able to freehand this, bring these guys in parallel, and, uh, and we're ready to actually size it. Now we're going to freehand this joker just a little bit. We're going to tappy tap tap these bad boys in. And what we want to do is get these lined up and flat each other. Now again, you see how I don't have enough room on the top of the anvil to get that job done? Can't tell you how much an anvil block helps in that situation. See how much nicer and easier that was? And that's where we are at. So now this tool is technically a blank. Oop, 
See, we're a little uneven right there at the top. Watch this. A tap, tap, a bang, 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 bang. A boom, 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 boom. A little bit more. A bang, 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 bang. A boom, 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 boom. Okay, there we go. Check it out. This tool is now a blank. It hasn't been fitted for any particular rivet, but we are good to go. And bam, here is our blank. Now, right now, this has not been sized for any type of bolt uh, or piece at all. So this is just a blank. But I want to show you how this guy works and what the theory is behind it uh, over here in our vise. Now, the operation of this guy is pretty simple. Basically, you'll insert a blank rod down here while it's hot. And again, we'll have a groove here in the middle. Uh, this goes into the vise and clampy clamp clamp. The piece will be held firmly, and now you have a way to actually make the head relatively easily. Now, this guy down here, this is a little heavy. I thought I may have, uh, I should have thinned it a little bit more because it's a, it's a little stiff. You don't need a lot of give, but you kind of need a little bit more give than this. I mean, this, this isn't Hercules' rivet header, but you get the idea. These can be made in several different sizes, and again, pretty simple tool, but you can see how much work goes into just getting this bad boy forged right here. So folks, that's where I'm going to stop it for today. Tomorrow, we're going to actually go ahead and size this for a particular size rivet. You can see how it works. But one of the things I want to point out is just how much work went into getting something like this. Now, the coolest thing about blacksmith to me is when you start with this really thick metal and you're able to draw it down into useful tools. It's not something that beginners get a whole lot of exposure to because you're buying stock that is really close to the size of the item that you're making. Blacksmiths back in the day didn't have that luxury. Like I said, steel came in three sizes, small, medium, and oh my God. All of these usually had to be changed, but it gave you mass to play with and allowed you to do cool things like this. If we were to start this out at three quarter or three eighths of an inch where it is now, we wouldn't really have, it would be so much work to get these square corners. Whereas if you start with something with more mass than what you end up with, it gets relatively easy. So guys, I got to say, uh, we are running up on one month since I have started putting videos up and it has been going straight on up the hill the way it needs to go. So I have to take a moment and thank all of you viewers that have been with me for all these years. I'm starting to see a lot of new guys in the comments, and certainly, certainly I have to thank all my Patreons. Uh, guys, understand that Patreons are funding fully half of what's going on here in the shop. So if you have the opportunity, please support me on Patreon. Uh, there's a donation link should be in the description. Uh, go to TrentonTie.com, pick up a book. All of these things are going directly to filming these videos, and yes, we are in fact burning it white hot. So again, I hope you guys are get your money worth because it's been pretty freaking awesome. And I also have to give a big shout out. We're going to be doing some live streams here shortly, and uh, we, we're going to have a we're going to have a special guest spot, at least in name, because some fool sent me a TV so I can read all the chat things uh, as they come up for the live stream. So uh, coming out shortly. <laughs> you guys be good.